I think in these types of crises, we human beings have a tendency to do three things. Number one, we over-rationalize the past. We try to look for examples from the past when they don't really exist. Number two, we over-dramatize the present. Uh, there's a certain sense of a hype that the situation is historic, that we've never been there before and that we might not survive. And number three, we underestimate the future. And I think in good Nordic fashion, I would call, call for everyone uh, to be calm, cool and collecting, collected and think that it's impossible to over-rationalize the past. Please, let's not over-dramatize what's going on. And please, let's try to think and prepare a little bit what might be uh, in stock in the future. Let's stop thinking about the world as some kind of a utopia, which is always perfect. These types of issues, such as COVID, always go through three phases. And the phases are number one, crisis, number two, chaos, and number three, suboptimal solution. That's the world we live in. And that was the world before COVID, and that will be the world after COVID. Now, my second point today uh, is on the EU uh, and uh, the European Union. And here, much like on a personal level, you first sort of go domestic and national. That's what a lot of EU member states did in the beginning of this crisis. Uh, they stopped the free movement of goods. Well, yes, stopped the free movement of people, um, services, uh, and to a certain extent, money as well. Uh, and, and in many ways, they wanted to protect their own. And, and, and this, is, this is understandable. But once the European Union woke up of its slumber, I would actually argue that it has done a lot and very fast. And let me just give you five quick pillars. Number one, the ECB's PEP program uh, and other programs linked to monetary policy. Number two, the European Investments Bank's uh, 200 billion euro program. Yes, leveraged eight times from 25 billion, but nevertheless, for SMEs. Number three, uh, the trust and sure programs, mostly on employment and social affairs, coming from the European Commission. Number four, the European Stability Mechanism, which was created for the previous crisis, uh, with a bazooka of over 400 billion euros. And now number five, uh, the Franco-German initiative uh, of last week on the so-called recovery fund, roughly speaking, 500 billion euros, the actual proposal uh, will be put forward by the European Commission tomorrow, and it will have some kind of a ratio of 70-30 loans versus grants or 60-40 or loans versus grants. We don't know at uh, this stage yet. When you collect all of that together, we're talking about an overall rescue package in the ballpark of two and a half to three trillion euros. Uh, this is a lot of money coming from uh, the European uh, Union. We had uh, a lot of EU programs uh, announced, quite sizable also, but do you think they're enough in kind of counterweighing the, the negative economic consequences that we're seeing, but also from a political front of view? I mean, is it enough to stem the rise of populism, Euroscepticism that we see, for example, in, in Italy? Is, is what we have seen so far from the EU side really ambitious enough uh, to stem uh, the COVID-19 crisis here? What do you think? Well, I guess the simple answer is to say that whatever the European Union does, it's never going to be enough. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. One is that the instruments are limited. Remember that the EU's budget uh, is approximately 1% of the GNI of the whole European area. Compare that to national budgets, which hover between 25 to 40% of, of GDP. So the redistributive power and capacity to act still lies on a lot of these issues um, with uh, the nation state. The second reason is communication. And I can say this 
uh, I think, uh, quite honestly, as a former prime minister, that usually the way in which European leaders pitch uh, whatever happens in Europe is to say everything that is bad comes from Brussels, so you blame Brussels, and everything that is good is thanks to me. Uh, and I don't know about the Danish debate, I don't know about uh, other countries who are online here, but you know, you're not going to get a, a, a national leader saying, thank you Ursula von der Leyen, thank you Christine Lagarde, thank you Werner Hoyer, uh, you know, for, for saving us. It, it just ain't going to happen. So that's why I'm saying that, please, let's stop thinking that the European Union is going to be the ultimate uh, response to everything. What it has put together is a tremendous package, but it will not be uh, enough. We should, in any case, already understand that we will be in a deep uh, recession come depression. It's just a question of how quickly do we get out of there. My final point on this, uh, the reason I think that it would be important to share risk and mutualization is basically for market stability uh, and, and, and long run sort of belief in the economy. Uh, and I think that's going to be the next battleground on this. As far as inciting feeling for the European Union, I hate to say this, but, you know, Brexit was probably the first time that people for a long time felt really emotional about what it was like to be, um, you know, European. And, and this is when we started to see a pro-European movements and, and to a certain extent a downshift of the anti-Europeans and, and the popularity ratings of the European Union went up. So what I'm saying, no gimmicks, no propaganda, the pendulum of pro-European, anti-European will swing. To be honest, I think the tipping point was the uh, ruling of the German Constitutional Court uh, on the ECB, which I think, and I'm just a humble political scientist, was uh, the German Constitutional Court shooting itself in the foot from all possible angles uh, linked to competence, uh, linked to anti-European sentiment, linked to muscle flexing between uh, the Karlsruhe Court and the European Court of Justice in, in Luxembourg. It really made a huge mess out of this. Uh, and as a consequence, I think it was easy for Chancellor Merkel to say, listen, France and Germany are going to show the way here. We put out uh, the suggestion uh, of a uh, crisis recovery fund and the rest is going to be history. Uh, Mario Centino was out uh, in uh, in Velto over the weekend saying that this could be the first step into a, a fiscal union. Is this the first step into a fiscal union? Um, because personally, I see a lot of hurdles to, to down that road. Well, uh, I guess, you know, if you recall, uh, used to be this wonderful theory called the neo-functional theory of European integration. And the neo-functionalists believed in the so-called spillover, which basically meant that integration in one area leads to pressure to integrate in another one. So, for instance, you start off, as one did, uh, with a coal and steel community in the 1950s. You notice that, hmm, this works. Let's move uh, towards an economic community. And you notice this works. Let's move towards uh, a free trade area, a customs union, there's pressure to start creating a single market. When you get a single market, uh, you get a common currency. When you get a common currency, you get a common monetary policy and you split and leave the fiscal policy out of it. I don't think, I don't know whether this will be the first step or not, but I think there's a certain inevitability that at the end of the day, we will start looking at different types of corners of fiscal policy inside the European Union. <laughs>